This book is called Shivaji Park, Dada 28, History, Places, People. It was published earlier this year by Speaking Tiger Books. It is part of a series that they have planned of monographs on neighborhoods. I have lived in Shivaji Park for practically all my life and that is a very long time and yet I really got to know the place in the course of writing this book. Today I am going to read from the chapter entitled The Birth of Shivaji Park. The outbreak of plague in Bombay in 1896 throws up a complex narrative of class, caste, community, tradition, ignorance and prejudice. The steps that the British government took to control the epidemic, such as forcible examination, isolation and quarantine caused intense anger among the citizens, many of whom fled to their villages to get away as much from the cure as from the disease. This is not the place to enter into that labyrinth of cause and effect. What concerns us here is that Shivaji Park owes its birth, at least partly, if not wholly, to the plague epidemic of 1896-97. The problem created by the plague was not only socially complex, but medically too. There was a great resistance within the medical fraternity to accepting the new idea that bacilli were the cause of the disease. In every culture, anywhere in the world, the plague has been seen as a divine retribution for man's sins. That superstition still clung to some medical men. Others resisted out of a sense of outrage that some whippersnappers were trying to sell them newfangled theories. One such whippersnapper was Dr. Sir Waldemar Mordecai Wolf Hafkin whom the government had requested to help contain the epidemic. Hafkin carried out his work in a pokey corridor of the Grant Medical College in Baikala. In January 1897, he had a vaccine ready. He tested it first on himself before trials were conducted on volunteers from the Baikala jail. Those who were inoculated survived the epidemic, while some members were while some members of the control group died. Hafkin arrived at the conclusion that the vaccine reduced risk by 50%. Disbelieving his findings, some officials insisted that the problem had to do entirely with the lack of sanitary conditions in the overpopulated city. The belief 
led to the setting up of the Bombay City Improvement Trust, BCIT, on 9th December 1898. The Trust's first task was to build avenues across the length and breadth of the city to open up its landlocked central and eastern regions to healthful sea breezes. The roads would incidentally solve another problem that had been troubling the British rulers greatly. They would reduce the dense growth of toddy palms and coconut trees on the island. Not only did the trees block the free flow of sea air, but were still their nurture created an unhealthy miasma on account of the local tradition of burying dried fish at their roots as manure. This noisome practice was held to be at least partly responsible for the rampant ill health among the British, cutting their lives down to the proverbial two monsoons. The BCIT's second task was to create new areas for housing on Mahim Island in order to decongest the city centre. This was to be achieved by reclaiming some land from the sea and acquiring some from the Koli, Bhandari, Suryabhamshi and other landowners of the island. The BCIT's first plans, known as Schemes 5 and 6, were designed to develop Dadar East, Matunga and Siam as residential precincts. An important feature of the schemes was building east-west roads that would release sea air to them. This entailed acquiring land from the landowners of the west. The landowners protested angrily. Why should they give up their land to benefit people living on the other side of the railway line? The land had been theirs from times immemorial and they paid taxes on it. This gave them clout. Their anger culminated in a meeting held on the Antonio de Silva grounds in 1915, a resolution was passed making their refusal to give up land for schemes 5 and 6 clear and demanding that a similar scheme be planned to develop Mahim Woods instead. In time, the demand was granted and Shivaji Park scheme Mahim for the development of one of the first planned precincts in the city was conceived. Before the scheme took off, a prickly administrative issue had to be resolved. There had been growing friction between the BCIT, which had been constituted by an act of the British Parliament and the municipal corporation whose councillors comprise the Indian elite of Bombay, including some landowners from the other west. By the end of the turf war, the BCIT was restricted to developing only the infrastructure, lights, streets, drains, while the municipal corporation took charge of the development of the park and the sale of plots for housing. By 1936-37, 
all the plots around Shivaji Park were sold. And by 1940, places on outlying roads, which did not come under the scheme, but benefited from the infrastructure, were also sold. The actual area of the park was most likely determined by the grassy meadow that is said to have existed there before. Apparently, it was a commons that became squelchy and unusable in the monsoon months, but was used in the dry months as a camping site by itinerant traders, craftsmen and performers, and as a meeting place for locals to celebrate festivals. Whether such a commons existed or not, the area of the park would have had to be contained within the two ring roads built for housing plots. The park was thrown open to the public in 1925. It was first called Mahim Park. In 1927, the tercentenary year of Shivaji's birth. There was a popular demand for its renaming after him. The Congress corporator and Gandhian freedom fighter Avantika Bhai Gokhale gave voice to the people's demand and it was named Shivaji Park. This event is commemorated on a tall wide column that stands with its back to the park and its face towards Cadell Road, renamed the Savarkar Mark. Currently, it is in a soiled state. Its base chipped and its sides plastered with the remains of handbills. A small people sapling has thrust itself out of a crack at the top. Our city fathers do not care very much for heritage.